Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Criminals Never Trust a Thief by Robert Silverberg Pick a Crime by Richard Reen Smith The Shipshape Miracle by Clifford D. Simak Moon of Memory by Bryce Walton The Stainless Steel Rat by Harry Harrison Never Trust a Thief by Robert Silverberg Writing as Ivor Jorgensen Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy February 1958 Narrated by Tom Trussell Kylie took one last fond look at that glittering heap of jewels in the back of the spaceship, nodded happily to himself, and began to set up a blast-off orbit. Somewhere down on the field far below, he could see dot-like figures, spaceport attendants, all firmly convinced that this was an authorised flight. He chuckled. This is the right way to pull a job, he thought contentedly. Hypnotise him silly, and then walk in and take what you want. His fingers skipped lightly over the control panel as he readied the ship for blast-off. For the first time in his life, he felt truly happy. Two million stellars of rare gems in the back of the ship, and even after cutting Thaklaru in for his share, that still left a million. A million stellars! Oh, that sounded good. Well, Kylie, are you going to spend all day dreaming? I'm waiting for you! The rolling thunder of Thaklaru's voice in Kylie's mind jolted him back to reality. I'm on my way, he said out loud, knowing that the alien was listening. I've got the stuff, and I'll be there before you know it. Good. I'm anxious to see those jewels. Don't worry about it, Thaklaru. I'm not worrying, but I know you'd be quite willing to blast off in the other direction and keep them all for yourself. Kylie grinned. Nothing's a secret from you, eh, Thaklaru? You don't miss a thing. I can't afford to, the alien's telepathic voice said. The first rule in thievery is never to trust an accomplice. That makes sense, Kylie admitted. Only there's no way I can escape you. Not when you can telepath anywhere in the galaxy. How do I get to your planet? Don't trouble yourself. Simply blast off, and I'll assume mental control of your ship once you're out in space. I prefer that the location of my world remain a secret, even to you. Kylie shrugged. OK, I won't argue. I'm blasting off now. He jabbed down on the firing stud. The stolen spaceship sprang up into the void, and Kylie felt the alien's mental emanations enfolding him, seizing control of the ship, guiding it, just as, a month before, similar emanations had come to him in the darkness of a jail cell in the under-dungeon of Alvarez Seven. They'd nailed him for a bungled burglary. He'd have made it all right, except that he hadn't foreseen one of the new model psionic alarms, and... Since he was a four-timer, they'd stuck him in solitary deep in the dank heart of the planet. The guard, a thick-muscled Alfarasian with three cold, slitted eyes, had hurled him into the cell, thrown him sprawling against the slimy stone. "'That ought to hold you, Kylie,' the Alfarasian growled. "'You've stolen your last jewel, Earthman.' Get out of here, Kylie said thinly. Don't stand here and gloat. I'd be free and out of here if that crazy alarm hadn't popped off. 
The guard chuckled. Relax and call off Riley. You've got plenty of time to get used to your new home. The door clanged shut. Kylie spat in the darkness as he heard the bolt slipping home. The unbreakable foolproof bolt of the escape-proof Alfaraz jail. And then... How would you like to be free in five minutes? A voice asked. Huh? Who's there? Kylie looked around, narrowing his eyes to see in the foggy blackness. But there was no one in, within sight. Don't strain your eyes, the voice said. And Kylie realized it was an unspoken voice in his mind. I'm a thousand light years away. The name is Thaklaru. Who are you? What are you? That doesn't concern you. I need your professional services, and I have a proposition to make. Go ahead, Kylie said, mystified. You're a jewel thief, and a good one. I can aid you in such a way that you'll be a perfect one. What do you mean? How would you like the power of instant hypnosis? The alien asked. You could go anywhere you liked, simply by convincing people you belonged there. My mind, projected out through the focus of yours, could do this thing. We could work as partners and divide fifty-fifty. Hold on, said Kylie suspiciously. What do you need me for, then? If you've got this power, why not just rob whatever you want yourself? There was the voiceless equivalent of a chuckle. I do not like to leave my home world. You will act as my travelling, ah, agent. Sounds good to me, Kylie said. I've got nothing to lose anyway. But how do I get out of here? A simple matter. Just be patient. Kindly waited. A few minutes later, the Alpharasian jailer showed up, but the look of scorn was gone from his eyes. Dreadfully sorry, Mr. Smith, the guard said humbly. There's been some mistake here. We thought you were someone else. Naturally, we'll indemnify you for this inconvenience. That's all right, Kindly said casually. Mistakes do happen, you know. This way, please. We're terribly sorry about the whole affair. Kindly smiled as the guard led him out of the cell block to freedom. You're a man of your word, Thaklaru, he thought. It's a deal. Once free, Kylie had spent a very pleasant three weeks in Alferra's Seven. Thaklaru's mind was with him at all times, and with his power of instant hypnosis, all doors were open to him. It was a simple matter. The big coup came when Kylie grew tired of the planet's pleasures. He travelled to the Emperor's palace. The guards bowed to him as he approached. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Kylie smiled politely and kept on going. He walked quickly through the palace, stopping only to ask a butler where the jewel room was. As it turned out, the Emperor himself was in the jewel room. Pardon me, Your Majesty, Kylie said. I'll have to have some of these, I'm afraid. The monarch looked up, met Kylie's eye, and froze. Of course, he said politely, go right ahead and he stood to one side while Kylie plundered the crown jewels. From there he travelled to the spaceport outside the city, where he commandeered a small one-man ship by asking its pilot to leave. Guided by Thaklaru, he arranged for clearance and blasted off. It had been simple, terribly, terribly simple. Almost dull, Kylie reflected, as his ship sped through space toward Thaklara's homeworld. He wondered idly what his partner in crime looked like. A grotesque, pulsating slug floating in a bath of some slimy fluid, perhaps. 
There would have to be something along those lines, Kylie thought, something that would keep Thaklauri from entering the worlds of the galaxy by himself and taking whatever he pleased. We make a good team, Thaklaru, Kylie said aloud. True, the alien said. With my power and your agility, we could steal anything the galaxy contained. Kylie turned and looked at the heap of jewels again. Two million stellars. Quickly he computed the value in earth currency and gasped. The haul was worth nearly ten billion dollars. Perspiration broke out all over him. He tried frantically not to think what he was thinking, but there was no way to keep the thoughts from flooding into his mind. He heard Thaklaru chuckling. No, Kylie, there's no way you can cheat me of my share of the wealth. Damn it, Thaklaru, do you have to keep listening to my mind? Can't I have a little privacy? Don't fear, Kylie. Your reaction is a perfectly understandable one, and I hold no rancor against you for desiring great wealth. I expect you to think that way, which is why I keep listening to you. I never trust an accomplice, remember? A new thought entered Kylie's mind. Say, what do you need these jewels for? Seems to me you would have anything you wanted. Money no object, so why do you want to be rich? Rich? I do not want to be rich. The jewels are pretty, though, and I like beautiful things. I covet them for purely aesthetic reasons. Okay with me, Kylie said. I have more practical ends in mind. It is understandable. Ah, you are approaching my home world now. Please prepare for deceleration. An hour later, Kylie stood on the soil of Thaklara's planet and looked around. Welcome, the alien's voice said. Kylie stood by the side of his spaceship and stared at the awesome sight. A vast chain of naked mountains sprang up like a row of gigantic teeth to the east bare, jagged peaks stretching up into dim immensity, twenty and thirty and forty thousand feet in the air. Wild, savage-looking vegetation swept fiercely around him, trees well over a thousand feet high and looking to be a block wide at their base. Just at a distance of a few feet, a monstrous cliff reared straight upward toward the swirling black and gold clouds. It was a strange, an utterly primitive world. Okay, I'm here, Kylie shouted. Where are you? I will be with you soon, the alien responded. Take the jewels from the ship. How do I decide which are yours and which are mine? Take them all. We will decide once they're out of the ship. A sudden ripple of terror ran through Kylie turning the little jewel thief cold. He felt dwarfed by the sheer magnitude of Thaklara's world. He wondered where the alien was, what sort of creature he might be. Your curiosity will soon be ended, Thaklara said. When you have brought the jewels out, I will appear. Kainish shrugged and started to climb the catwalk that led into the ship. There was little sense in trying to argue with Thaklara's abilities. If he didn't go willingly, the alien would only force him. He gathered the jewels into a double handful and brought them back outside, dropping them onto a bare patch of reddish-green soil. Returning, he brought the rest of them out. Okay, he said, they're all here. Good. They are lovely. Suppose you show up, and let's divide these things, Kylie said. I'm tired of your mental voice. Let's hear the real thing. Very well. A clap of thunder seemed to split the sky, a deafening, booming noise that made the ground quiver. Kylie cowered in fright as the sound was repeated. 
and this time he was able to detect words. I am Thoklaru. Where are you? Look upward, the booming voice cried. Hesitantly, Kylie turned his gaze upward and gasped. The cliff he had thought stood next to him was no cliff at all. It was a vast alien creature, stony and terrifying, whose head vanished in the fuzzy clouds far overhead. Again came the booming noise, I am Thaklaru. Ah, I see why you needed an accomplice, Kylie said in a weak voice. Something, someone of your size. Yes. I could never venture into anything as tiny as one of your cities. Kindly licked his lips nervously. Well, here are the jewels. Let, let's divide them. One bit of business first, the alien's thunderous boom came. You have served well, but you cannot live. What? It is necessary, Kylie. There are ways of extracting information from a man's subconscious, and I would not have my existence known. Suddenly the sky was black. Kylie looked up and saw what could only be a foot, a monstrous, horrible foot, blotting out the sunlight overhead. I warned you, Kylie, never trust an accomplice. And I was your accomplice. The sky rang with a gigantic alien's cosmic laughter. Kylie covered his ears to blot out the hideous sound. Tears of rage flooded his eyes. It's not fair, it's... Sorry, Kylie. Like an ant, the thief thought bitterly. I'm dying like an ant. And then the great foot came down. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Pick a Crime by Richard Reen Smith, writing as Richard R. Smith. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, May 1958. Narrated by Tom Trisse. The girl was tall, wide-eyed and brunette. She had the right curves in the right places and would have been beautiful if her nose had been smaller, if her mouth had been larger and if her hair had been wavy instead of straight. Hank said you wanted to see me, she said when she stopped beside Joe's table. Yeah, Joe nodded at the other chair. Have a seat. He reached into a pocket, withdrew five ten-dollar bills and handed them to her. I want you to do a job for me. It'll only take a few minutes. The girl counted the money, then placed it in her purse. Joe noticed a small counterfeit detector inside the purse before she closed it. What's the job? I'll tell you later. He gulped the remainder of his drink, almost pouring it down his throat. Hey, you're trying to make yourself sick? Not sick drunk. Been trying to get drunk all afternoon. As the liquor settled in his stomach, he waited for the warm glow. But the glow didn't come. The bartender had watered his drink again. Trying to get drunk? The girl inquired. Are you crazy? No, it's simple. If I get drunk, I can join the AAA and get free room and board for a month while they give me a treatment. It was easy enough to understand, he reflected, but a lot harder to do. The CPA robot bartenders saw to it that anyone got high if they wanted, but comparatively few got drunk. Each bartender could not only mix drinks, but could also judge by a man's actions and speech when he was on the verge of drunkenness. At the proper time, since drunkenness was illegal, a bartender always watered the drinks. Joe had tried dozens of times in dozens of bars to outsmart them, but had always failed, and in all of New York's millions there had been only a hundred cases of intoxication during the previous years. The girl laughed. 
If you're that hard up, I don't know if I should take this fifty or not. Why don't you go out and get a job like everyone else? And in answer, Joe handed her his CPA ID card. She grunted when she saw the large letters that indicated the owner had dangerous criminal tendencies. When she handed the card back, Joe felt an impulse to tear it to pieces. He had done that once, and gone through a mountain of red tape to get another. Everyone was required by law to carry a CPA ID card and show it upon a request. I'm sorry, the girl said. I didn't know you were a DCT. And who'll hire a guy with criminal tendencies? You know the score. When you try to get a job, they ask to see your ID before they even tell you if there's an opening or not. If your CPA ID says you're a DCT, you're SOL, and they'll tell you there's no openings. Oh, I've had several jobs. Jobs like all DCTs get. I've been a garbage man, street cleaner, ditch digger. On the other side of the room, the jukebox came to life with a roar, and a group of teenagers scrambled to the dance floor. Feeling safe from hidden microphones because of the uproar, he leaned across the table and whispered in the girl's ear, That's what I want to hire you for. I want you to help me commit a crime. If I get convicted of a crime, I'll be able to get a good job. The girl's lips formed a bright red circle. Say, you really got big plans, don't you? He smiled at her admiration. It was something big to plan a crime. A civilization weary of murder, robbery, kidnapping, counterfeiting, blackmail, rape, arson, and drunkenness had originated the CPA, Crime Prevention Association. There were no longer any prisons. CPA officials had declared loudly and emphatically that their job was to prevent crime, not punish it. And prevent it they did, with thousands of ingenious crime prevention devices and methods. They had made crime almost impossible, and during the previous year only a few hundred men in the whole country had been convicted of criminal acts. No crime was ever punished. If a man was smart enough to kill someone, for instance, he wasn't sent to prison to be punished. He wasn't punished at all. Instead, he was sent to a hospital where all criminal tendencies were removed from his mind by psychologists, shock treatments, encephalographic devices, a form of prefrontal lobotomy, and a dozen other methods. An expensive operation, but since there were few criminals, only ten in New York during the past year, any city could afford the CPA hospitals. The CPA system was, actually, cheaper than previous methods because it did away with the damage caused by countless crimes, did away with prisons and their guards, large police forces, squad cars and weapons. And ironically, a man who did commit a crime was a sort of hero. He was hero to the millions of men and women who had suppressed impulses to kill someone, beat their mates, get drunk or kick a dog. Not only a hero, but because of the CPA treatment he was, when he left one of the CPA hospitals, a thoroughly honest and hard-working individual a man who could be trusted with any responsibility, any amount of money, and therefore an ex, a convicted criminal who received the treatment was commonly called an ex because he was in the strictest sense of the world an ex-criminal. An ex was always offered the best jobs. Well, the girl said, I'm honoured, really, but I got a date at ten. Let's get it over with. You said it'd only take a few minutes. OK, let's go. The girl followed him across a room, around tables, through a door, down a hall, through a back door, and into the alley. She followed him up the dark alley until he turned suddenly and ripped her blouse and skirt. He surprised her completely, but when she recovered, she backed away, her body poised like a wrestler's. What's the big idea? Scream, Joe said. Scream as loud as you can, and when the cops get here, tell him I tried to rape you. The plan was perfect, he told himself. Attempted rape was one of the few things that was a crime merely because a man attempted it. A crime because it theoretically inflicted psychological injury upon the intended victim, and because millions of women voters had voted it a crime. On the other hand, 
attempted murder, robbery, kidnapping, etc., they were not crimes. They weren't crimes because the DCT didn't complete the act, and if it didn't complete the act, that meant simply that the CPA had once again functioned properly. The girl shook her head vigorously. Sorry, buddy, can't help you that way. Why didn't you tell me what you wanted? What's the matter? Joe complained. I'm not asking you to do anything wrong. You stupid jerk! What do you think this is, the Middle Ages? Don't you know almost every woman knows how to defend herself? I'm a sergeant in a WSDA. Joe groaned. The WSDA, Women's Self-Defence Association, a branch of the CPA. The WSDA gave free instruction in judo and jiu-jitsu, even developed new techniques of wrestling and instructed only women in those new techniques. The girl was still shaking her head. Can't do it, buddy. I'd lose my rank if you were convicted of... Do I have to make you scream? Joe inquired tiredly and advanced toward the girl. And that rank carries a lot of weight. Hey, stop it! Joe discovered to his dismay that the girl was telling the truth when she said she was a sergeant in the WSDA. He felt her hand on his body, and in the time it takes to blink twice, he was flying through the air. The alley's concrete floor was hard. It had always been hard, but he became acutely aware of its lack of resiliency when his head struck it. There was a wonderful moment while the world was filled with beautiful stars and streaks of lightning through which he heard distant police sirens. But the wonderful moment didn't last long, and darkness closed in on him. When he awoke, a rough voice was saying, OK, snap out of it. He opened his eyes and recognised the police commissioner's office. It would be hard not to recognise. The room was large, devoid of furniture except for a desk and chairs, but the walls were lined with the controls of television screens, electronic calculators, and a hundred other machines that formed New York's mechanical police force. Commissioner Hendricks was a remarkable character. There was something wrong with his glands, and he was a huge, greasy bulk of a man, with bushy eyebrows and a double chin. His steel-grey eyes showed something of his intelligence, and he would have gone far in politics if fate hadn't made him so ugly, for more than half the voters who elected men to high political positions were women. Anyone who knew Hendricks well liked him, for he was a friendly, likeable person. But the millions of women voters who saw his face on posters and on the TV screens saw only the ugly face and heard only the harsh voice. The President of the United States was a capable man, but also a very handsome one, and the fact that a man who looked something like a bulldog had been elected as New York Police Commissioner was a credit to Hendricks and millions of women voters. "'Where's the girl?' Joe asked. "'I processed her while you were out cold. She left. Joe, you—' "'Okay,' Joe said. "'I'll save you the trouble. I admit it. Attempted rape. I confess.' Hendricks smiled. "'Sorry, Joe. You missed the boat again.' He reached out and turned a dial on his desktop. We had a microphone hidden in that alley. We have a lot of microphones hidden in a lot of alleys. You'd be surprised at the number of conspiracies that take place in alleys. Joe listened numbly to his voice as it came from one of the hundreds of machines on the wall. Scream! Scream as loud as you can, and when the cops get here, tell them I tried to rape you. And then the girl's voice. Sorry, buddy, can't help. He waved his hand. OK, shut it off. I confess to conspiracy. Henricks rose from behind the desk, walked leisurely to where Joe was slouched in a chair. Give me your CPA ID. Joe handed him the card with trembling fingers. He felt as if the world had collapsed beneath him. Conspiracy to commit a crime wasn't a crime. Anyone could conspire, and if the conspirators were prevented from committing a crime, then that meant the CPA had functioned properly yet once again. That meant the CPA had once again prevented crime, and the CPA didn't punish crimes or attempted crimes, and it didn't attempt to prevent crimes by punishment. If it did, 
That would be the violation of the new civil rights. Hendricks crossed the room, deposited the card in a slot and punched a button. The machine hummed and a new card appeared. When Hendricks handed him the new card, Joe saw that the words Dangerous Criminal Tendencies were now in red and larger than before. And in slightly smaller print, the ID card stated that the owner was a DCT first class. You've graduated, Hendrick said coldly. You guys never learn, do you? Now you're a DCT first class instead of a second class. You know what that means? Hendrix leaned closer until Joe could feel his breath on his face. That means your case history will be turned over to the newspapers. You'll be the hobby of thousands of amateur cops. You know how it works. It's like this. The Joneses are sitting around tomorrow night and they're bored. Then Mr. Jones says, Let's go watch this Joe Harper. So they look up your record. Amateur cops always keep records of first classes in scrapbooks. And they see that you stop frequently at Walt's Tavern. So they go there and they sit and drink and watch you, trying not to let you know they're watching you. They watch you all night, just hoping you'll do something exciting, like trying to kill someone, so they can be the first ones to yell, Police! They'll watch you because it's exciting to be an amateur cop, and if they ever did prevent you from committing a crime, they'd get a nice reward and they'd be famous. Lay off, Joe said. I've got a headache. That girl... Hendricks leaned even closer and glared. You listen, Joe. This is interesting. You see, it doesn't stop with Mr. and Mrs. Jones. There's thousands of people like them. Years ago, they got their kicks from reading about guys like you. But these days, things are dull because it's rare when anyone commits a crime. So every time you walk down the street, there'll be at least a dozen of them following you. And no matter where you go, you can bet there'll be some of them sitting next to you, standing next to you. During the day, they'll take your picture with their spy cameras that look like buttons on their coats. At night, they'll peep at you through your keyhole. Your neighbours across the street will watch you through binoculars and lay off! Joe squirmed in the chair. He'd been lectured by Hendrix before and was always an unpleasant experience. The huge man was like a talking machine once he got started, a machine that couldn't be stopped. And the kids are the worst, Hendricks continued. They have junior CPA clubs. They keep records of hoodlums like you in little cardboard boxes. They'll stare at you on the street and stare at you through restaurant windows while you're eating meals. They'll follow you in public restrooms and watch you out of the corners of their eyes while they wash their little hands. And almost every day when you look back, You'll see a dozen freckled-faced little boys following you half a block behind, giggling and gaping at you. They'll follow you until the day you die, because you're a freak. Joe couldn't stand the breath in his face any longer. He rose and paced the floor. And it doesn't end there, Joe. It goes on and on. You'll be the object of every do-gooder and parlour psychologist. Strangers will stop you on the street and say, I'd like to help you, friend. Then I'll ask you queer questions like, Did your father reject you when you were a child? Do you like girls? How does it feel to be a DCT first class? And then there'll be strangers who hate DCTs. They'll stop you on the street and insult you, call your names, spit on you, and... OK, goddammit, stop it! Hendrick stopped, wiped the sweat from his face with a handkerchief and lit a cigarette. I'm doing you a favour, Joe. I'm trying to explain something you're too dumb to realise by yourself. We've taught everyone to hate crime and criminals, to hate them as nothing has ever been hated before. Today a criminal is a freak, an alien. Your life will be a living hell if you don't leave New York. You should go to some small town where there aren't many people, or be a hermit, or go to Iceland, or... Joe eyed the huge man suspiciously. Favour, did you say? The day you do me a favour. Hendrix shrugged his shoulders negligently. Not entirely a favour. I want to get rid of you. Usually I come up here and sit around and read books, but guys like you are a nuisance and take up my time. 
I couldn't leave if I wanted to, Joe said. I'm flat broke. Thanks to your CPA system, a DCT can't get a decent job. Hendricks reached into a pocket, withdrew several bills and extended them. I'll loan you some money. You can sign an INU and pay me back a little at a time. Joe waved the money away. Listen, why don't you do a favour? Why don't you frame me? If I'm such a nuisance, pin a crime on me. Any crime. Can't do it. Convicting a man of a crime he didn't commit is a violation of civil rights and a crime in itself. Hmm. Why don't you take the free psycho treatment? A man doesn't have to be a DCT. With the free treatment, psychologists can remove all the criminal tendencies and... Go to those head shrinkers! Hendrick shrugged again. Have it your way. Joe laughed. If your damned CPA is so all-powerful, why can't you make me go? A violation of civil rights. Damn it, there must be some way you can help me. We both want the same thing. We both want to see me convicted of a crime. How can I help you without committing a crime myself? Hendricks walked to his desk, opened a drawer and removed a small black book. See this? It contains names and addresses of all the people in New York who aren't properly protected. Every week we find people who aren't protected properly, blind spots in our protection devices. As soon as we find them, we take steps to install anti-robbery devices, but this is a big city and sometimes it takes days to get the work done. In the meantime, any one of these people could be robbed. But what can I do? I can't hold this book in front of your nose and say, Here, Joe, pick a name and go out and rob him. He laughed nervously. If I did that, I'd be committing a crime myself. He placed the book on the desktop, took a handkerchief from a pocket again, and wiped sweat from his face. Excuse me a minute. I'm dying of thirst. There's a water cooler in the next room. Joe stared at the door to the adjoining office as it closed behind the big man. Hendricks was, unbelievably, offering him a victim, offering him a crime. Almost running to the desk, Joe opened the book, selected a name and address and memorised it. John Grulewski, apartment 204, 2141 Orange Street. When Hendricks came back, Joe said, thanks. Huh? Thanks for what? I didn't do anything. When Joe reached the street, he hurried towards the nearest subway. As a child, he had been frightened of the dark. As a man, he wasn't afraid of the dark itself, but the darkened city always made him feel ill at ease. The uneasiness was, more than anything else, caused by his own imagination. He hated the CPA, and at night he couldn't shrug the feeling that the CPA lurked in every shadow, watching him, waiting for him to make a mistake. Imagination or not, the CPA was almost everywhere a person went. 24 hours a day, millions of microphones hidden in taverns, alleys, restaurants, subways and every other place imaginable waited for someone to say the wrong thing. Everything the microphones picked up was rooted to the CPA brain, a monster electronic calculator. If the words, let's see a movie, were received in the brain, they were discarded. But if the words, let's roll this guy, were received, the message was traced and a police helicopter would be at the scene in two minutes. And scattered all over the city were not only hidden microphones, but hidden television cameras that relayed visual messages to the brain, and hidden machines that could detect a knife or a gun in someone's pocket at 40 yards. Every place of business, from the largest bank to the smallest grocery store, was absolutely impenetrable. No one had even tried to rob a place of business for years. Arson was next to impossible because of the heat detectors, devices placed in every building that could detect, radar-like, any intensity of heat above that caused by a cigarette lighter. Chemical research had made poisoning someone an impossibility. There were no drugs containing poison, and while an ant poison might kill ants, no concentrated amount of it could kill a human. The FBI had always been a powerful organisation, but under the supervision of the CPA, it was a scientific colossus, and to think of kidnapping someone or to contemplate the use of narcotics was pointless. A counterfeiter's career was always short-lived. 
Every place of business and millions of individuals had small counterfeit detectors that could spot a fake and report it directly to the brain. And the percentage of crimes had dwindled even more with the appearance of the robot police officers. Many a criminal in the past had gambled that he could outshoot a pursuing policeman. But the robots were different. They weren't flesh and blood. Bullets bounced off them, and their aim was infallible. It was like a fantastic dream come true, only the dream wasn't fantastic anymore. With the huge atomic power plants scattered across the country and supplying endless electrical power at ridiculously low prices, no endeavour that required power was fantastic. The power required to operate the CPA devices cost each taxpayer an average of $4 a year, and the invention, development and manufacture of devices had cost even less. And the CPA had attacked crime through society itself, striking at the individual. In every city there were neon signs that blinked subliminally with a statement, Crime is filth. Listening to a radio or watching television, if a person heard station identification, he invariably heard or saw, just below perception, the words, Crime is filth. If he went for a walk or a ride, he saw the endless subliminal posters declaring, Crime is filth. And if he read a magazine or newspaper, he always found in those little dead spaces when editor couldn't fit anything else, the below perception words, Crime is filth. It was monotonous, and after a while a person looked at the words and heard them without thinking about them, and they were imprinted on his subconscious over and over, year after year, until he knew that crime was the same as filth, and that criminals were filthy things. Except men like Joe Harper, no system is perfect. Along with thousands of other DCTs, Joe refused to believe it, and when he reached apartment 204 at 2141 Orange Street, he felt as if he'd inherited a gold mine. The hall was dimly lit, but when he stood before the door number 204, he could see that the wall on either side of it was new. That is, instead of being covered with dust, dirt and stains as the other walls were, it was clean. The building was an old one, the hall was wide, and the owner had obviously constructed a wall across the hall, creating another room. If the owner had reported the new room as required by law, it would have been wired with CPA burglar-proof devices, but evidently he didn't want to pay for installation. When Joe entered the cubbyhole, he had to stand to one side in order to close the door behind him. The place was barely large enough for bed, chair and bureau. It was a place where a man could fall down at night and sleep, but where no normal man could live day after day. Fearing that someone might detect him before he actually committed the crime, Joe hurried to the bureau and searched it. He broke out in a sweat when he found nothing but underwear and old magazines. If he stole underwear and magazines, it would still be a crime, but the newspapers would splash satirical headlines Instead of being respected as a successful criminal, he would be ridiculed. He stopped sweating when he found a watch under a pile of underwear. The crystal was broken, one hand was missing, and it wouldn't run. But, perfection itself, engraved on the back was the inscription, To John with love. This trial would be a clean-cut one. It would be easy for the CPA to prove ownership and that a crime had been committed. Chuckling with joy, he opened the window and shouted, Thief! Police! Help! He waited a few seconds and then ran. When he reached the street, a police helicopter landed next to him. Strong metal arms seized him. Cameras clicked and recorded the damning evidence. When Joe was securely handcuffed to a seat inside the helicopter, the metal police officers rang doorbells. There was a reward for anyone reported a crime, but no one admitted shouting the warning. He was having a nightmare when he heard the voice, Hey, wake up, hey! He opened his eyes, saw Hendrick's ugly face, and thought for a minute he was still having the nightmare. 
I just saw your doctor, Hendrix said. He says your treatment is over. You can go home now. I thought I'd give you a lift. As Joe dressed, he searched his mind in trying to find some difference. During the treatment, he had been unconscious or drugged, unable to think. Now he could think clearly, but he could find no difference in himself. He felt more relaxed than he'd ever felt before, but that could be an after-effect of all the sedatives he'd been given, and he noticed when he looked in the mirror he was paler. The treatment had taken months, and he had, between operations, been locked in his room. Hendricks was standing by the window. Joe stared at the massive back. Deliberately goading his mind, he discovered the biggest change. Before, the mere sight of the man had aroused an intense hatred. Now, even when he tried, he succeeded in arousing only a mild hatred. They had toned down his capacity to hate, but not done away with it altogether. "'Come here and take a look at your public,' said Hendricks. Joe went to the window. Three stories below, a large crowd had gathered on the hospital steps. A band, photographers, television trucks, cameramen and autograph hunters. He'd waited a long time for this day. But now, another change in him. He put the emotion into words. "'I don't feel like a hero. Funny, but I don't. "'Hero!' Hendricks laughed and with his powerful lungs it sounded like a bull snorting. "'You think a successful criminal is a hero? You stupid!' He laughed again, and waved a hand at the crowd below them. "'You think those people are down there because they admire what you did. They're down there waiting for you because they're curious, because they're glad the CPA caught you, and because they're glad you're an ex. You're an ex-criminal now!' and because of your treatment you'll never be able to commit another crime as long as you live, and that's the kind of guy they admire, so they want to see you, shake your hand, and get your autograph. Joe didn't understand Hendricks completely, but the part he did understand he didn't believe. A crowd was waiting for him. He could see the people with his own eyes. When he left the hospital they'd cheer and shout and ask for his autograph. If he wasn't a hero, what was he? It took half an hour to get through the crowd. Cameras clicked all around him. A hundred kids asked for his autograph. Everyone talked at once and cheered, smiled, laughed, patted him on the back and cheered some more. Only one thing confused him during all the excitement. A white-haired old lady with tears in her eyes said, "'Thank heaven it was only a watch!' "'Thank heaven you didn't kill someone. God bless you, son!' And then the old lady had handed him a box of fudge, and left him in total confusion. What she had said didn't make sense. If he had killed someone rather than stealing a watch, he would be even more of a hero, and the crowd would have cheered even louder. He knew he had stood outside the CPA hospitals many times, and the crowds always cheered louder when an ex-murderer came out. In Hendrick's robot-chauffeured car, he ate the fudge and consoled himself with the thought, "'People are funny. Who can understand them? Feeling happy for one of the few times in his life, he turned toward Hendricks and said, "'Thanks for what you did. It turned out great. I'll be able to get a good job now.' "'That's why I met you at the hospital,' Hendricks said." I want to explain some things. I've known you for a long time, and I know you're spectacularly dumb. You can't figure out some things for yourself, and I don't want you walking around the rest of your life thinking I did you a favour. Joe frowned. Few men had ever done him a favour, and he had rarely thanked anyone for anything. And now, after thanking the man who'd done him the biggest favour of all, the man was denying it. You robbed Groluski's apartment. Hendrick said. Grilewski is a CPA employee and he doesn't live in the apartment you robbed. The CPA pays the rent for that one and he lives in another. We have a lot of places like that. You see, it gives us a way to get rid of saps like you before they do real damage. We use it as a last resort when a DCT first class won't take the free psycho treatment or... 
Well, it's still a favour. Hendrick's face hardened. Favour? You wouldn't know a favour if you stumbled over one. I did it because it's standard procedure for your type of case. Anyone can, free of charge, have treatment by the best psychologist. Any DCT can stop being a DCT by simply asking for the treatment and taking it. But you wouldn't do that. You wanted to commit a crime, get caught and be a hero, an ex. The car passed one of the CPA playgrounds. Boys and girls of all ages were laughing, squealing with joy as they played games designed by CPA psychologists to relieve tension. And, despite the treatment, Joe shuddered when he saw the psychologist standing to one side, quietly watching the children. The whole world was filled with CPA employees and volunteer workers. Everywhere you went, it was there, quietly watching you and analysing you and if you showed criminal tendencies, it watched you even more closely and analysed you even more deeply until it took you apart and put you back together again the way it wanted you to be. Being an ex, you'll get the kind of job you always wanted, Hendricks continued. You'll get a good paying job, but you'll work for it. You'll work eight hours a day, work harder than you ever worked before in your life, because every time you start to loaf, a voice in your head is going to say, Work! Work! Exes always get good jobs because employers know they're good workers. But during these next few days, you'll discover what being an ex is like. You see, Joe, the treatment can't possibly take all the criminal tendencies out of a man. So the treatment does the next best thing. You'll find a set of laws written in your mind. You might want to break one now and then but you won't be able. I'll give you an illustration. Joe's face reddened as Hendricks proceeded to call him a series of names. He wanted to smash the fat, grinning face, but the muscles in his arms froze before it moved an inch. And worse than that, a brief pain ripped through his skull, a pain so intense that, had it lasted a second longer, he would have screamed in agony. And above the pain, a voice whispered in his head, Unlawful to strike someone except in self-defence. He opened his mouth to tell Hendricks exactly what he thought of him, the CPA, the whole world, but the words stayed in his throat, the pain returned, and the mental voice whispered, Unlawful to curse. He had never heard how the treatment prevented an ex from committing a crime, and now that he knew it didn't seem fair, he decided to tell the whole story to the newspapers as soon as he could, and as soon as that decision formed in his mind, his body froze, the pain returned, and the voice, unlawful to divulge CPA procedure. See what I mean? Hendricks asked. A century ago, you would have been locked in a prison and taxpayers' money would have supported you until the day you died. With the CPA system, you returned to society, a useful citizen, unable to commit the smallest crime. And you've got a big hand in your dirty little mind that's going to slap it every time you get the wrong kind of thought. It'll keep slapping you until you learn. It might take weeks, months or years, but you'll learn sooner or later to not even think about doing anything wrong. He lit a cigarette and blew a smoke ring at the car's plush ceiling. It's a great system, isn't it, Joe? A true democracy. Even a jerk like you is free to do what he wants, as long as it's legal. I think it's a lousy, filthy system. Joe's head was still tingling with pain and he felt suffocated. The CPA was everywhere, only now it was also inside his head, telling him he couldn't do this, couldn't do that. All his life it had been telling him he couldn't do things he wanted to do, and now... Hendricks laughed. You'll change your opinion. We live in a clean, wonderful world, Joe. A world of happy, healthy people. Except for freaks like yourself. Criminals are... Let me out! Joe grabbed at the door and was on the sidewalk, slamming the door behind him before the car stopped completely. He stared at the car as it pulled away from the curb and glided into the stream of traffic again. He realised he was a prisoner a prisoner inside his own body. 
made a prisoner by a world that hated him back. He wanted to spit his content, but the increasingly familiar pain and voice prevented him. It was unlawful to spit on a sidewalk. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Shipshape Miracle by Clifford D. Simak Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, January 1963 Narrated by Tom Trussell If Chevy O. Sherwood ever had believed in miracles, he believed in them no longer. He had no illusions now. He knew exactly what he faced. His life would come to an end on this uninhabited backwards planet, and there would be none to mourn him, none to know. Not, he thought, that there would be any mourners under any circumstance. Although there were those who would be glad to see him, who would come running if they knew where he might be found. These were people, very definitely, that Sherwood had no desire to see. His great, one might say his overwhelming, desire not to see them could account in part for his present situation, since he had taken off from the last planet of record without filing flight plans and lacking clearance. Since no one knew where he might have headed, and since his radio was junk, there was no likelihood at all that anyone would find him, even if they looked, which would be a matter of some doubt. Probably the most that anyone would do would be to send out messages to other planets to place authorities on the alert for him. And since his spaceship, for the lack of a certain valve for which he had no replacement, was not going anywhere, he was stuck here on this planet. If that had been all there had been to it, it might not have been so bad, but there was a final irony that under other circumstances, if it had happened to someone else, let's say, would have kept Sherwood in stitches for forthright merriment for hours on end at the very thought of it. But since he was the one involved, there was no merriment. For now, when it could gain no benefit, he was potentially rich beyond even his own most greedy and most lurid dreams. On the ridge above the camp he'd set up beside his crippled spaceship lay a strip of clay-cemented conglomerate that fairly reeked with diamonds. They lay scattered over the hillside, washed out by the weather. They were mixed liberally in the gravel of the tiny stream that wended through the valley. They could be picked up by the basket. They were of high quality. There were several, the size of human skulls, that probably were priceless. Sherwood was of a hardy, rough and tumble breed. Once he became convinced of his situation, he made the best of it. He made his camp into a home and laid in supplies, digging roots, gathering nuts, drying fish and making pemmican. If he was to be cast in the role of a Robinson Crusoe, he proposed to be at least comfortably well fed. In his spare time, he gathered diamonds, dumping them in a pile outside his shack, and in the idle afternoons or the long evenings, he sat beside his campfire and sorted them out, washing them free of clinging dirt and grading them according to their size and brilliance. The very best of them he put into a sack, designed for easy grabbing if the time should ever come when he might depart the planet. Not that he had any hope this would come about. Even so, he was a man who planned against contingencies. He always tried to have some sort of loophole. Had this not been the case, his career would have ended long before, at any one of a dozen times or places. That it apparently had come to an end now could be attributed to a certain lack of foresight in not carrying a full complement of spare parts. 
although perhaps this was understandable, since never before in the history of spaceflight had that particular valve which now spelled out Sherwood's doom ever misbehaved. Perhaps it was well for him that he was not an introspective man. If he had been given too much searching thought, he might have found himself living with his past, and there were places in his past that were far from pretty. He was lucky in many other ways, of course. The planet was not a bad one, a sort of New England planet with a rocky tumbled terrain, forested by scrubby trees and distinctly terrestrial. He might just as easily have been marooned upon a jungle planet, or one of the icy planets, or any of another dozen different kinds that were not tolerant of life. So he settled in, and made the best of it, and didn't even bother to count off the days, for he knew what he was in for. He counted on no miracle. The miracle he had not counted on came late one afternoon as he sat, cross-legged, sorting out his latest haul of priceless diamonds. The great black ship came in from the east across the rolling hills. It whistled down across the ridges and settled to the ground a short distance from Sherwood's crippled ship and his patched-together shack. It was no patrol vessel, although in his position Sherwood would have welcomed even one of these. It was a kind of ship he'd never seen before. It was globular and black, and it had no identifying marks on it. He leapt to his feet and ran toward the ship. He waved his arms in welcome and whooped with his delight. He stopped a hundred feet away when he felt the first whiff of the heat that had been picked up by the vessel's hull in its plunge through atmosphere. "'Hey, in there!' he yelled. And the ship spoke to him. "'You need not yell,' it told him. "'I can hear you very well.' "'Who are you?' asked Sherwood. "'I am the ship,' the voice told him. "'Quit fooling around,' yelled Sherwood, "'and tell me who you are.' For the sort of answer he had given was foolishness. Of course it was the ship. It was someone in the ship, talking to him through a speaker in the hull. "'I have told you,' said the ship. "'I am the ship.' "'But there is someone speaking to me.' "'The ship is speaking to you.' "'All right, then,' said Sherwood. "'If you want it that way, it's OK with me. "'Can you take me out of here? "'My radio's broken and my ship disabled.' "'Perhaps I can,' said the ship. "'Tell me who you are.' Sherwood hesitated for a moment, and then he told who he was, quite truthfully, for it suddenly had occurred to him that this ship was as much an outlaw as he was himself. It had no markings, and all ships must have markings. "'You say you left your last port without proper clearance?' "'Yes,' said Sherwood. "'There were certain circumstances.' "'And no one knows where you are? No one's looking for you?' "'How could they?' Sherwood asked. "'Where do you want to go?' "'Just anywhere,' said Sherwood. "'I have no preference.' for even if they should land him somewhere where he had no wish to be, he still would have a running chance. On this planet he had no chance at all. "'All right,' said the ship. "'You can come aboard.' A hatch came open in the hull, and a ladder began running out. "'Just a second, Sherwood shouted. "'I'll be right there.' He sprinted to the shack, and grabbed his sack of the finest diamonds, then legged it for the ship. He got there almost as soon as the ladder touched the ground. The hull still was crackling with warmth, but Sherwood swarmed up the ladder, paying no attention. He was set for life, he thought, unless— And then the thought struck him that they might take the diamonds from him. They could pretend it was payment for his passage, or they could simply take them without an excuse of any sort at all but it was too late now. He was almost in the hatch. To drop the sack of diamonds now would do no more than arouse suspicion and would gain him nothing. 
It came of greediness, he thought. He did not need this many diamonds. Just a half dozen of the finest dropped into his pockets would have been enough. Enough to buy him another ship so he could return and get a load of them. But he was committed now. There was nothing he could do except to see it through. He reached the hatch and tumbled through it. There was no one waiting. The inner lock stood open, and there was no one there. He stopped to stare at the emptiness, and behind him the retracting ladder rumbled softly, and the hatch kissed to a close. "'Hey!' he shouted. "'Where is everyone?' "'There is no one here,' the voice said. "'But me.' "'All right,' said Sherwood. "'Where do I go to find you?' "'You have found me,' said the ship. "'You are standing in me.' "'You mean?' "'I told you,' said the ship. "'I said I was the ship. "'That is what I am.' "'But no one—' "'You do not understand,' said the ship. "'There is no need of any one. "'I am myself. "'I am intelligent. "'I am part machine, part human. "'Rather, perhaps, at one time I was. "'I have thought in recent years "'the two of us have merged "'so that we're neither human nor machine, "'but something new entirely.' "'You're kidding me,' said Sherwood, beginning to get frightened. "'There can't be such a thing.' "'Consider,' said the ship, "'a certain human who had worked for years to build me, "'and who, as he finished me, found death was closing in. "'Let me out!' yelled Sherwood. "'Let me out of here! I don't want to be rescued! I don't want—' "'I'm afraid, Mr. Sherwood, it is rather late for that. "'We're already out in space.' "'Out in space? We can't be. It isn't possible.' "'Of course it is,' the ship told him. "'You expected thrust. There was no thrust. We simply lifted.' "'No ship,' insisted Sherwood, "'can get off a planet.' "'You're thinking, Mr. Sherwood, of the ships built by human hands, "'not of a living ship, not of an intelligent machine.' not of what becomes possible with the merging of a man and a machine. "'You mean you built yourself?' "'Of course not. Not to start with. I was built by human hands to start with. But I've redesigned myself and rebuilt myself, not once, but many times. I knew my capabilities. I knew my dreams and wishes.' I made myself the kind of thing I was capable of being, not the half-way, makeshift thing that was the best the human race could do. The man you spoke of, Sherwood said, the one who was about to die. He is part of me, said the ship. If you must think of him as a separate entity, he, then, is talking to you. For when I say I, I mean both of us. "'for we've become as one.' "'I don't get it,' Sherwood told the ship, "'feeling the panic coming back again. "'He built me, long ago, "'as a ship which would respond "'not to the pushing of a lever "'or the pressing of a button, "'but to the mental commands of the man who drove me. "'I was to become, in effect, "'an extension of that man. "'There was a helmet that the man would wear, "'and he'd think into the helmet.' "'I understand,' said Sherwood. "'He'd think into the helmet, "'and I was so programmed that I'd obey his thoughts. "'I became, in effect, a man, "'and the man became, in effect, the ship he operated.' "'Nice deal,' Sherwood said enthusiastically, "'never being one upon whom the niceties of certain advantages were ever lost. "'He finished me,' and he was about to die, and it was a pity that such one should die, one who had worked so hard to do what he had done, who'd given up so much, who'd never had seen space, who had gone nowhere. No, said Sherwood, in revulsion, knowing what was coming. No, he'd not done that. 
It was a kindness, said the ship. It was what he wanted. He managed it himself. He simply gave up his body. His body was a worthless hulk that was about to die. The modifications to accommodate a human brain rather than a human skull were quite elementary. And he has been happy. We have both of us been happy. Sherwood stood without saying anything. In the silence he was listening for some sound of any kind of tiny rattle or hum, for anything at all to tell him that the ship was operating. But there was no sound and no sense of motion of any sort. Happy, he said, where would you have found happiness? What's the point of all this? That, the ship said solemnly, is a bit hard to explain. Sherwood stood and thought about it, the endless voyaging through space without a body, with all the desires, all the advantages, all the capabilities of a body gone forever. "'There is nothing for you to fear,' said the ship. "'You need not concern yourself. We have a cabin for you, just down the corridor, the first door to your left.' "'I thank you.' Sherwood said, although he was nervous still. If he had had a choice, he told himself, he'd stayed back on the planet. But since he was here, he would have to make the best of it. And there were, he admitted to himself, certain advantages and certain possibilities that needed further thought. He went down the corridor and pushed on the door. It opened on the cabin. For a spaceship, it looked comfortable enough. A little cramped, of course, but then all cabins were. Space is at a premium on any sort of ship. He went in and placed his sack of diamonds on the bunk that hinged out from the wall. He sat down in the single metal chair that stood beside the bunk. "'Are you comfortable, Mr. Sherwood?' "'Very comfortable,' he said. It was going to be all right, he told himself. A very crazy setup, but it would be all right. Perhaps a little spooky and a bit hard to believe, but probably better, after all, than staying marooned back there on the planet. For this would not last forever, and the planet could have been, most probably would have been, forever. It would take a while to reach another planet for space was rather sparsely populated in this area. There would be time to think and plan. He might be able to work out something that would be to his great advantage. He leaned back in the chair and stretched out his legs. His brain began to click in a ceaseless scurrying back and forth, nosing from every angle all the possibilities that existed in this setup. It was nice, he thought this entire operation. The ship undoubtedly had figured out some angles for itself which no human yet had thought of. There were a lot of things to do. He'd have to learn the capabilities of the ship, and give close study to its personality, seeking out its weak points and its strength. Then he'd have to plan his strategy, and be careful not to give away his thinking. He must not move until it was entirely ready there might be many ways to do it. There might be flattery, or there might be a business proposition, or there might be blackmail. He'd have to think on it, and study, and follow out the line of action that seemed to be the best. He wondered at the ship's means of operation. Anti-gravity, perhaps, so far considered as a source of power. He got up from the chair and paced, three paces across the room, or a fusion chamber, or perhaps a method which had not been and back, restlessly pondering odds. Yes, he thought, it would be a nice kind of ship to have. More than likely there was nothing in all of space that could touch it in speed and manoeuvrability, nothing that could overhaul it should he ever have to run. It could apparently set down anywhere. It was probably self-repairing, for the ship had spoken of redesigning and of rebuilding itself. 
with the memory of his recent situation still fresh inside his mind. This was comforting. There must be a way to get the ship, he told himself. There had to be a way to get it. It was something that he needed. He could buy another ship, of course. With the diamonds in the sacking he could buy a fleet of ships. But this was the one he wanted. Maybe it had been pure luck this ship had picked him up, for any other legal ship would probably turn him over to the authorities at the next port of call. But this ship didn't seem to mind who he was or what his record might be. Any other ship that was not entirely legal would have grabbed off not only the diamonds that he had put, but his discovery of the diamond field. But this particular ship had no concern with diamonds. What a setup, he thought, a human brain and a spaceship tied together, so closely tied together that their identities had merged. He shivered at the thought of it, for it was a gruesome thing. Although perhaps it had not meant too much to that old man who was about to die, he had traded an aged and death-marked body for many years of life. Perhaps life as a part of a space-travelling machine was better than no life at all. How many years, he wondered, had it been since that old man had translated himself into something else than human? A hundred? Five hundred? Perhaps even more than that. In those years, where had he been, and what might he have seen? And most pertinent of all, what thoughts had run through and congealed and formed within his mind? What was life like for him? Not a human sort of life, of course, not a human viewpoint, but something else entirely. Sherwood tried to imagine what it might be like, but gave up in dismay. It would necessarily be a negation of everything he lived for. All the sensual pleasure, all the dreams of gain and glory, all the neat behaviour patterns he had set up for himself, all his self-made rules of conduct and of conscience. A miracle, he thought. As a matter of fact, there had been two miracles. The first had been when he had been able to set his ship down without a crack-up when the valve had failed. He had come in close above the planet's surface to find a place to land, and suddenly the valve went out and the engine failed, and there he'd been, plunging down above the rough terrain. Then suddenly I'd glimpsed a place where his landing might be just barely possible, and I'd fought the controls madly to hit that certain spot, and finally had hit it, alive. It had been a miracle that he had made the landing, and the coming of the ship to rescue him had been the second miracle. The bunk dropped down flat against the wall, and his sack of diamonds was dumped onto the floor. "'Hey, what goes on?' yelled Sherwood. Then he wished he had not yelled, for it was quite clear exactly what had happened. The support that held the bunk had not been snapped properly into place, and had given way, letting down the bunk. "'Something wrong, Mr. Sherwood?' asked the ship. "'No, not a thing,' said Sherwood. "'My bunk fell down. I guess it startled me.' He bent down to pick up the diamonds. As he did, the chair quietly and efficiently slid back against the wall, folded itself up, and slid into a slight depression that exactly fitted it. Squatted to pick up the diamonds, Sherwood watched the chair in horrified fascination, then swiftly spun around. The bunk no longer hung against the wall, also had fitted itself into another niche. Cold fear speared into Sherwood. He rose swiftly to his feet, turning like a man at bay. He stood in a bare cubicle. With both the bunk and chair retracted, he stood within four bare walls. He sprang toward the door, and there wasn't any door. There was only wall. He staggered back into the centre of the cubicle and spun around to view each wall in turn. There was no door in any of the walls. The metal went up from floor to ceiling without a single break. The walls began to move, closing in on him, sliding in, retracting. He watched, incredulous, frozen, 
thinking that perhaps it imagined the moving of the walls. But it was not imagination. Slowly, inexorably, the walls were closing in. Had he put out his arms, he could have touched them on either side of him. "'Ship!' he said, fighting to keep his voice calm. "'Yes, Mr. Sherwood.' "'You are malfunctioning. The walls are closing in.' "'No,' said the ship. "'No malfunction, I assure you. A very proper function. My brain grows tired and feeble. It is not the body only. The brain also has its limits. I suspected that it might, but I could not know. There was a chance, of course, that separated from the poison of a body it might live in its bath of nutrients for ever. No, rasped Sherwood, his breath strangling in his throat. No, not me. Who else? asked the ship. I have searched for years, and you are the first who fitted. Fitted? Sherwood screamed. Why, of course, the ship said calmly, happily. A man who would not be missed. No one knowing where you were. No one hunting for you. No one who will miss you. I had hunted for someone like you, and had despaired of finding one. For I am humane. I would cause no one grief or sadness. The walls kept closing in. The ship seemed to sigh in metallic contentment. Believe me, Mr. Sherwood, it said, finding you was a very miracle. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Moon of Memory by Bryce Walton Originally published in Future combined with Science Fiction Stories, November 1950 Narrated by Tom Trussell Barstack walked the mile across the red Martian plain. He felt but little emotion as he reached the resort building, and there were sports rockets waiting on the other side. He had to get one of those rockets and get to Demas, or die trying. One would be about as good as the other. Then a slight tension grew in his stomach, and sweat began to run down under his helmet and pressure suit, down his sharp nose and the burned face, as he started directly for the sports rockets. He saw no one at all at first, then the grey and black uniformed cop not ten feet away. The cop's helmet tilted, and curious eyes studied Barstack. Barstack didn't wait for any further reaction. His face pulled into a tight, scarred grin as he fired. The kinetic energy release burned away the side of the cop's head. A scream floated past from some onlooker, intensified by the communicator in Barstack's helmet. Barstack ran. It was almost to one of the rockets, and exhilaration filled him. He sensed an alien thing, so alien. Freedom. Maybe freedom just for a while. Then he heard shouts and saw men running in like spokes into a wheel hub. He threw himself flat behind a loading truck someone had abandoned en route to a supply rocket. Supersun guns. They wouldn't kill him, against the law to kill criminals in the new system. More civilised to turn men into zombies for the rest of their lives in a mine three miles underground. They had to take him alive. A supersonic gun put a man out of action fast, but it didn't kill him. Sound waves tuned right could crack a man's helmet open. In Martian atmosphere that meant unconsciousness in a few seconds. If they got a line on him, he wouldn't have a chance to use his heat gun. He didn't intend to be taken. He'd get a few of them, and then have enough heat left to turn on himself. Barstack shivered as part of the metal truck spanged and crackled like glass. They'd got a line on him all right, fast. He fired, and three men turned into smoke and red steam. The others disappeared behind rockets, sleds and outbuildings. They could take their time. A face appeared to his right, a man trying to edge away, 
but then he stopped. A tourist in a dude suit, all spangled and glittery, styled to the minute of the Martian hunting. A face, young and pinched and shabby with fear. His arms dangled limply. His lips behind the helmet were tight with terror. Wait, his voice sounded through the communicator. Wait, please don't shoot. I'm unarmed. I won't. Barstack grinned. A gag. The guy took a step back and Barstack fired. A light charge right through the belly. The man folded to one side, his mouth stretching, closing, opening. He grasped his middle and blunt ran through his fingers. He was on his knees, raising a red hand. Wait, don't! Barstack's next charge was heavier, and it took off the man's head and helmet in a burst of flame. Barstack was on his feet, long legs straining desperately, running. The sleek blue sports rocket slid across his path on its grav plates. Far beyond it rose the high cubed buildings of the city of Sanskran, looking very near, although it was at least fifty miles away. A woman's face stared out at him through the rocket's translucent nose, a beautiful face inside a platinum helmet. Barstack didn't stop to think. He leaped upward, swung himself to the top of the rocket's skin, and pressed the stud that should open the cockpit. He grabbed desperately. He screamed as he felt his helmet crack. They'd gotten a line. The frigid cold clutched his face. He choked for oxygen, trying to yell. He staggered back and collapsed across the top of the rocket. He buried the opening on top of his helmet in his arms, released all available oxygen. It gave him a few seconds, but he couldn't move. He dimly saw the girl raise up through the cockpit. Nothing made any sense then. She had the heat gun in her hand and was firing. She was lifting him and throwing him over her shoulder, carrying him back toward the cockpit. In this light gravity it wasn't a feat of strength. But it made no sense to Barstack, none at all. A woman he'd never seen saving him. For what? All the lights went out then. Barstack stopped being curious. It was very still, somewhere. Very still. Phobos' shine came in through the plastics of the rocket, and the controls were quiet in front of him. A dead sea bottom stretched away outside as far as anyone would want to see. Lichen and fungus, and a few of those big blind Martian beetles wandering, following the direction of the hurtling moon. And then Barstax saw Demos rising, shining like a monstrous beckoning firefly through the night. He felt a terrible lassitude. He just sat there, his head against the plastics looking out. He knew he wasn't alone in the rocket, but he didn't look at who was beside him. He stared upwards at Demas. For ten years, in that Martian prison for incorrigibles, he had planned escape, and the only escape was to Demas. Once a man could escape into the unlimited expanse of the stars, but in the new system the nets were too tight. The eerie light of the double moons bathed the rocket as the larger moon joined the smaller. Demos was his only hope, if any remained. There, they said, a man neither lived nor died ever again. The Martians were kind, people said, but who really knew? The Martians had retired quietly to Demos when the Earthmen came to Mars. They had a peculiar alien culture nebulous and utterly inhuman, with their floating, wispy, mist-like shapes that suggested incomputable age, shapes the moons could shine through, and their fog cities. No one bothered them on Demos, a barren rock even Earth companies couldn't justify exploiting. But the Martians had peculiar abilities. Inhuman they were, but they seemed to have great influence over the human mind and the nervous system. On Demas, it was said, there were dreams for a man who had nothing else. Anyone, even a man like Barstack, was safe on Demas. Few ever came back from where only the lost went, and those who did come back, it was said, didn't remember. 
and for Barstack certainly there was no place else to go. Now, through circumstances beyond him, he had a rocket. He was away from the copse, and seemingly free. The girl. His helmet had been removed. Out of the corner of his eye he watched the girl secretly in the other pilot seat, calmly smoking a parayet. Balstack saw the heat gun in her lap. He had a fondness for the weapon. It had taken him ten years to piece it together. The psych boys at the prison with their intricate scanners had made a mistake with Barstack. Maybe the only one they'd ever made since the new system. But even they weren't infallible. They had uncovered his inventive ability, even though he'd always had it. They had put him in the shops, down among the power tools and the atomic machines. Ten years was a long time to build a simple heat gun. It had taken patience. His hand darted out fast, hooked the heat gun from her lap. She gasped, then sank back again and looked at him. She wore the regular sports outfit, the helmet, the thigh boots, an expensive piece of blonde goods, very expensive, with an oval face and pointed chin, skin light and very clear. She gave him a slow, steady look that was like turning on a cyclotron. Her lithe figure reminded him. Sure, there'd been other, but so long ago. You can put the gun away, she said calmly. Didn't I save your life? There may be trouble for me, but Daddy Sayers can always buy his daughter out of trouble. My name's Marion Sayers. Whatever it costs, the excitement's worth it. Sayers. When Barstack had been in prison ten years ago, Sayers had been one of the richest robber barons in the system probably the richest by now. What would Marion Sayers want with Barstack? She laughed, had a wild, odd sound. Her face had a wild look too. I heard somebody say Barstack, she said. And then I had to get you out of there. Why? You were the most infamous man in history when I was a little girl. I used to dream about you. And all at once there was an old dream, and I could make it come true, so I did. All the credits in the world to spend, and dying of boredom. I've tried everything, and found nothing at all, Barstack. You've tried Demas? Even Demas. No one knowing, of course, but, well, they have some pretty interesting things, but still only dreams. This is reality, Barstack. Carl Barstack. I can call you Carl. I'll get out if you want, and you can take my rocket, but please take me with you. The vital animal warmth of her reached out to him, and he put his arms around her and drew her close against him. He looked into her eyes, and it was as if he looked into a book that was forbidden to him because of hidden secrets. His pulse pounded. She watched him mutely, only her parted lips trembled slightly. A small muscle at the corner of her mouth twitched. He slid his hands flat against her shoulders. Her lips parted and her tongue touched them for a moment. They were wet and glistening, and she was firm and warm in his arms. Her head went back and she shut her eyes. He kissed her. It was all right, he thought. Then he looked above the blonde hair. She was probably cracked somewhere upstairs filled with phony dreams of adventure and glamour, and the devil knew what, intrigued by the name of a guy who really didn't live any more. Maybe she didn't know it, didn't see the greying hair of him the way he saw it, nor the face so scarred it couldn't register emotion any more. And if nothing else, she was good for a hostage. It was still a long way up to Demas. "'Maybe we can get away,' she whispered, her eyes closed. I mean, into space. Maybe you could do some of the things you did in the old days. We could live for a while. I heard that once you stopped a ship en route to Venus and lifted twenty billion in credits. Sure, he remembered. He smiled thinly, but he didn't say anything. He didn't tell her that the days of the Barstax were gone for good. Finally, he said, Sure, you can come along, and thanks for the ride. He took the rocket up itself. 
They were pursued for a while, but the sports rocket was a lot faster than any cop wagon this side of Earth. Marion didn't seem to care when she saw he was heading for Deimos instead of outer space. He explained about the big nets out there, and of how they'd have to figure out a way to get through. She kept looking at him with a kind of awe, her eyes wide and deeply dark. She talked about herself. We'll hole up here for a while, Balstak said. Maybe we can find a way through the nets. You, you don't have to stay. I'll stay with you, Carl, right to the end. You say you've been here to Demos before? She nodded, never taking her eyes from his hard, unemotional face. All my life I guess I've been looking for something. Maybe I thought I'd find it on Demos. I didn't. I found release there. I can find real life with you, maybe the kind that flames so high for a moment, but is worth a full lifetime of mundanity. I can find life with you, Carl, if you'll pardon my being so forward. Maybe it's death we're looking for, Carl, an escape from a system that's destroyed initiative, a system that's tied up the human heart in a bunch of laws and hooked them together into a big machine. Demus, a great barren rock, its soaring crags sharp as splintered steel, masses of shadow, dark as death, and splashes of brilliant colour and you spotted one of these misty, foggy-looking martial places here and there, wavering like something in a dream. From the time the rocket settled on its grav plates, from that moment on, things turned into a dream for Barstack. Marianne seemed to know her way around. Not many had the guts to leave here once they came, but she had a strong will there, an odd woman, one he would have liked to have known yesterday. There was a music and the vapour that lulled him into lethargy, something like sleep, only it wasn't sleep. There seemed to be rooms shifting, vague, translucent, and figures drifting like mist. He seemed to hear voices, but they were inside him, high, thin, like the sighing of plucked strings whispering in a low, dreaming, distant key. He heard Marion say a whisper, Might as well enjoy it while we're here. There are dreams here, many dreams, Carl, any you want. Rest a while, Carl, rest and sleep, and later we'll plan what to do. Yeah, sure, he thought vaguely. That's why I'm here. No, not that. I'm here because this is the end of the rocky road, and no further for me. He was drifting, sinking away, floating. He dimly saw her face above him, disembodied, her eyes strangely bright. The Martians were masters of something called mnemonics. He knew that. Masters of mental probing and the digging out of memory. Hypnosis or something like it, but way beyond that. He was in a Martian city, in a valley on Deimos somewhere in a building, in a room, but he would never know the real shape of it, or what it really was. Her voice whispered, Carl, they understand humans, they don't hate us. They understand us better than we will ever understand ourselves. They know what we really want deep inside, and they can give us whatever it is. Don't worry about anything, Carl. I was here for a while, and I know about the dreams. I'll fix everything for you. Fine, he murmured. He was lying somewhere. He was floating somewhere. It didn't matter where, not any more. Far away he heard her voice now. Were you ever happy, Carl? I don't remember. Happiness? He tried to laugh. Can't you remember happiness, Carl? He whispered to her of things he had forgotten. Shadows and shapes appeared in the cloudy whiteness, ghostly and strange. Wavering outlines darkened and altered. He remembered. He hadn't for a long time, but he did now. In the asteroids where his father had been a mucker, mining heavy beryllium, paired at a stuff. And his mother calling to him, and he was running, laughing. Happiness. That was a long time back, 
and that was where happiness ended. That was when the cops came and tried to take his father from mining illegally, and he had resisted. That was in the old system, and they had shot him with an electron rifle, his body exploding, spraying the cold rocks with red and awful memory, and his mother screaming and running, falling, drifting down a thousand feet into darkness, her screams fading, fading. Marian's voice came to him softly. Music sang too, poignant, eerie, caressing, gentle, and indefinably sad. Poor Carl, she whispered, poor Carl. Dimly he saw her face, like a part of mist, and then he saw the gun reaching toward him out of the vapour. Instinctively he started to reach for it, but he couldn't move, drugged. He whispered, he felt very tired, tired and old. What's the play? What? I'm going to kill you, Carl. Kill me? I felt sorry for you. I still do. But not sorry enough. I decided to kill you back there on Mars, and then when you came here I thought of something else. I thought it would reveal something, something that would justify what you are. There wasn't that enough. You never had a chance, Carl. You knew happiness, but it was too long ago. We are alone in this room, left to our dreams. But I am not dreaming. I wish I was, Barstack said. I thought that here something would show inside of you, so I wouldn't hate you so much. But I do. I hate you more than I can tell you. But it's enough so that I have to kill you. Why? he whispered. I hate you so much that I wanted to kill you. I knew if the police got you, you wouldn't die, and I think death is a worse thing for you under the circumstances than to be returned to prison. So I got you out of there. I knew that sometime I would get a chance to kill you. So here it is. You're dreaming, Carl, but I'm not. I... All that. The things you said, you were lying? Partly. You were a romantic figure once, and what I said about myself, that was only the way it used to be. The Martians are therapists, in a way. If you want to leave, you can, but for most the dreams are better. I left. I began to live then, Carl. I married two weeks ago. It was a beautiful thing for me. I loved my husband. But you wouldn't understand. You never got a chance to learn. My husband was the man you killed down there by the truck. Remember, Carl, the man who was unarmed, who didn't know what it was all about, who begged you not to kill him? We came to Mars for a honeymoon, Carl. I was waiting for him in the rocket. He was coming to meet me. Her finger moved. Her face tightened. But he didn't feel anything. He heard her muted cry, and then the voice as the Martian he had seen only vaguely before came back. The shape wavered ghost-like from the corner, and he heard the Martian again. This is not a place for the old emotions. There is no revenge here, no death. She screamed and screamed, her face twisting with hate. I want to kill him, let me, let me. The Martian's thoughts were so calm and gentle, so old and wise. Relax and sleep for a while. Maybe this time you'll want to stay with us here forever. She didn't answer. Balstack closed his eyes again. He had remembered happiness, felt it, re-experienced it. And now he didn't want to die. The Martian's thoughts were dimmer now, and Barstack drifted, and little fingers of crepuscular light fingered out toward him, alluring, disarming, and he drifted back down the slideboard of time where pain and ugliness were no longer. Far away, the Martian's voice, talking to Marion perhaps, Barstack didn't know. Humans are sick. The sickest ones eventually come here. 
more and more will come. Some day, perhaps, we can help all of you find your way backward or forward to happiness, and out of the old seas of pain. Sleep, both of you, sleep. There is only the happiness that was, or that might have been. There is no more pain. And then Barsack was with his father again, running down the steep slope under the bright promising light of a million stars, frosty and marvellously clear. His father was laughing, his own wild abandoned joy as he ran beneath the clouds, rifts where the sunlight showed, brightening the ragged tops of the asteroid's great metal mountains. He heard his mother calling to him, and he ran faster. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Stainless Steel Rat by Harry Harrison Originally published in Astounding Science Fiction, August 1957 Narrated by Tom Trissel when the office door opened suddenly, I knew the game was up. It had been a money-maker, but it was all over. As the cop walked in, I sat back in the chair and put on a happy grin. He had the same sombre expression and heavy foot that they all have, and the same lack of humour. I almost knew to the word what he was going to say before he uttered a syllable. "'James Bolivar de Grizz, I arrest you on the charge!' I was waiting for the word charge. I thought it made a nice touch that way. As he said it, I pressed the button that set off the charge of black powder in the ceiling. The crossbeam buckled, and the three-ton safe dropped through right on the top of the cop's head. He squashed very nicely, thank you. The cloud of plaster dust settled, and all I could see of him was one hand, slightly crumpled. It twitched a bit, and the index finger pointed at me accusingly. His voice was a little muffled by the safe, and sounded a bit annoyed. In fact, he repeated himself a bit. On the charge of illegal entry, theft, forgery. He ran on like that for quite a while. It was an impressive list, but I had heard it all before. I didn't let it interfere with my stuffing all the money from the desk drawers into my suitcase. The list ended with a new charge, and I would swear on a stack of thousand credit notes that high that there was a hurt tone in his voice. In addition, the charge of assaulting a police robot will be added to your record. This was foolish, since my brain and larynx are armoured and in my midsection. That I know well, George, but your little two-way radio is in the top of your pointed head, and I don't want you reporting to your friends just yet. One good kick knocked the escape panel out of the wall, and gave access to the steps to the basement. As I skirted the rubble on the floor, the robot's fingers snapped out at my leg, but I had been waiting for that, and they closed about two inches short. I have been followed by enough police robots to know by now how indestructible they are. You can blow them up or knock them down, and they keep coming after you, dragging themselves by one good finger and spouting saccharine morality all over the while. That's what this one was doing. Give up my life of crime and pay my debt to society and such. I could still hear his voice echoing down the stairwell as I reached the basement. Every second was timed now. I had about three minutes before they would be on my tail, and it would take me exactly one minute and eight seconds to get clear of the building. That wasn't much of a lead, and I would need all of it. Another kick panel opened out into the label-removing room. None of the robots looked up as I moved down the aisle. I would have been surprised if they had. They are all low-grade M-types, short on brains and good only for simple, repetitive work. That was why I hired them. They had no curiosity as to why they were taking the labels off the filled cans of azote fruits, or what was at the other end of the moving belt that brought the cans through the wall. They didn't even look up when I unlocked the door that was never unlocked that led through the wall. I left it open behind me as I had no more secrets now. Keeping next to the rumbling belt, I stepped through the jagged hole I had chopped in the wall of the government warehouse. I had installed the belt too. This and the hole were the illegal acts that I had to do myself. Another locked door opened into the warehouse itself. 
The automatic forklift truck was busily piling cans onto the belt and digging fresh ones out of the ceiling-high piles. This forklift had hardly enough brains to be called a robot, was just followed taped directions to load the cans. It stepped around it, and dog trotted down the aisle. Behind me, the sounds of my illegal activity died away. It gave me a warm feeling to still hear it going full blast like that. It had been one of the nicest little rackets I'd ever managed. For a small capital outlay, I had rented the warehouse that backed on the government warehouse. A simple hole in the wall, and I had access to the entire stock of stored goods, long-term supplies that I knew would be untouched for months or years in a warehouse this size. Untouched, that is, until I came along. After the hole had been made and the belt installed, it was just a matter of business. I hired the robots to remove the old labels and substitute the colourful ones I had printed. Then I marketed my goods in a strictly legal fashion. My stock was the best, and due to my imaginative operation, my costs were very low. I could afford to undersell my competitors and still make a handsome profit. The local wholesalers had been quick to sense a bargain, and I had orders for months ahead. It had been a good operation, and could have gone on for quite a while. I stifled that train of thought before it started. One lesson that has to be remembered in my line of business is that when an operation is over, it is over. The temptation to stay just one more day, or to cash just one more check, can be almost overwhelming. Ah, how well I know. I also know that it is also the best way to get better acquainted with the police. Turn your back and walk away. Live to graft another day. That's my motto, and it's a good one. I got where I am because I stuck to it. And daydreams aren't part of getting away from the police. I pushed all thoughts from my mind as I reached the end of the aisle. The entire area outside must have been swarming with cops by this time, and I had to move fast and make no mistakes. A fast look right and left, nobody in sight. Two steps ahead and press the elevator button. I'd put a meter on this back elevator, and it showed that the thing was used once a month on the average. It arrived in about three seconds, empty, and I jumped in, thumbing the roof button at the same time. The ride seemed to go on forever, but that was just subjective. By the record, it was exactly 14 seconds. This was the most dangerous part of the trip. I tightened up as the elevator slowed. My 75 caliber recoilless was in my hand. That would take care of one cop, but no more. The door shuffled open, and I relaxed. Nothing. They must have the entire area covered on the ground, so they hadn't bothered to put cops on the roof. In the open air now, I could hear the sirens for the first time, a wonderful sound. They must have had half of the entire police force out from the amount of noise they were making. I accepted it as any artist's except tribute. The board was behind the elevator shaft where I had left it, a little weather-stained but still strong. A few seconds to carry it to the edge of the parapet and reach it across to the next building. Gently. This was the one dangerous spot where speed didn't count. Carefully onto the end of the board, the suitcase held against my chest to keep my centre of gravity over the board. One step at a time, a thousand foot drop to the ground. If you don't look down, you can't fall. Over. Time for speed. The board behind the parapet, if they didn't see it at first, my trail would be covered for a while at least. Ten fast steps and there was a door to the stairwell. It opened easily, and it better have. I had put enough oil on the hinges. Once inside, I threw the bolt and took a long, deep breath. I wasn't out of it yet, but the worst pass, where I ran the most risk, was past. Two uninterrupted minutes here, and they would never find James Bolivar, alias Slippery Jim degrees. The stairwell at the roof was a musty, badly lit cubicle that was never visited. I had checked it carefully a week before for phono and optic bugs, and it had been clear. The dust looked undisturbed, except for my own footprints. I had to take a chance that it hadn't been bugged since then. 
the calculated risk must be accepted in this business. Goodbye, James de Gris, weight 98 kilos, age about 45, thick in the middle and heavy in the jowls, a typical businessman whose picture graces the police files of a thousand planets, also his fingerprints. They went first. When you wear them, they feel like a second skin, a touch of solvent though, and they peel off like a pair of transparent gloves. All my clothes next, then the girdle in reverse. That lovely paunch that straps around my belly and holds twenty kilos of lead mixed with thermite. A quick wipe from the bottle of bleach, and my hair was its natural shade of brown. The eyebrows, too. The nose plugs and cheek pads hurt coming out, but that only lasts a second. Then the blue-eyed contact lenses. This process leaves me mother naked, and I always feel as if I had been born again. In a sense it is true. I had become a new man, twenty kilos lighter, ten years younger, and with a completely different description. The large suitcase held a complete change of clothes and a pair of dark-rimmed glasses that replaced the contact lenses. All the loose money fitted neatly into a briefcase. When I straightened up, I really felt as if ten years had been stripped from me. I was so used to wearing that weight that I never noticed it until it was gone put a real spring in my step. The thermite would take care of all the evidence. I kicked it all into a heap and triggered the fuse. It caught with a roar and bottles, clothes bags, shoe, weights, et al. burned with a cheerful glare. The police would find a charged spot on the cement and a microanalysis might get them a few molecules off the walls, but that was all they would get. The glare of the burning thermite threw jumping shadows around me as I walked down three flights to the 112th floor. Luck was still with me. There was no one on the floor when I opened the door. One minute later, the express elevator let me and a handful of other business types out into the lobby. Only one door was open to the street and a portable TV camera was trained on it. No attempt was being made to stop people from going in and out of the building most of them didn't even notice the camera and the little group of cops around it. I walked towards it at an even pace. Strong nerves count for a lot in this business. For one instant I was square in the field of that cold glass eye, then I was past. Nothing happened, so I knew I was clear. That camera must have fed direct to the main computer at police headquarters. If my description had been close enough to the one they had on file, those robots would have been notified, and I would have been pinned before I had taken a step. You can't outmove a computer-robot combination, not when they move and think in microseconds. But you can outthink them. I had done it again. A cab took me about ten blocks away. I waited until it was out of sight, then took another one. It wasn't until I was in the third cab that I felt safe enough to go to the space terminal. The sounds of sirens were growing fainter and fainter behind me, and only an occasional police car tore by in the opposite direction. They were sure making a big fuss over a little larceny, but that's the way it goes on these over-civilised worlds. Crime is such a rarity now that the police really get carried away when they run across some. In a way, I can't blame them. Giving out traffic tickets must be an awful dull job. I really believe they ought to thank me for putting a little excitement in their otherwise dull lives. It was a nice ride to the spaceport, being located, of course, far out of town. I had time to lean back and watch the scenery and gather my thoughts. Even time to be a little philosophical. For one thing, I could enjoy a good cigar again. I smoked only cigarettes in my other personality, and never violated that personality, even in strictest privacy. The cigars were still fresh in the pocket humidor where I had put them six months ago. I sucked a long mouthful and blew the smoke out at the flashing scenery. It was good to be off the job, just about as good as being on it. I could never make my mind up which period I enjoyed more. I guess they're both right at the time. My life is so different from that of the overwhelming majority of people in our society that I doubt if I could even explain it to them. 
They exist in a fat, rich union of worlds that have almost forgotten the meaning of the word crime. There are few malcontents, and even fewer that are socially maladjusted. The few that are still born, in spite of centuries of genetic control, are caught early, and the aberration quickly adjusted. Some don't show their weakness until they are adults. They are the ones who try their hand at pity crime, burglary, shoplifting, such. They get away with it for a week or two, or a month or two, depending on the degree of their native intelligence. But sure as atomic decay, and just as predestined, the police reach out and pull them in. That is almost the full extent of crime in our organised, dandified society. 99% of it, let's say. It is that last and vital 1% that keeps the police department in business. That 1% is me, and a few others like me, a handful of men scattered around the galaxy. Theoretically, we can't exist, and if we do exist, we can't operate. But we do. We are the rats in the wainscoting of society. We operate outside of their barriers and outside of their rules. Society had more rats when the rules were looser, just as the old wooden buildings had more rats than the concrete buildings that came later. But they still had rats. Now that society is all ferro-concrete, and stainless steel, there are fewer gaps between the joints, and it takes a smart rat to find them. A stainless steel rat is right at home in this environment. It is a proud and lonely thing to be a stainless steel rat, and it is the greatest experience in the galaxy if you can get away with it. The sociological experts can't seem to agree why we exist. Some even doubt that we do. The most widely accepted theory says that we are victims of delayed psychological disturbance that shows no evidence in childhood when it can be detected and corrected and only appears later in life. I have naturally given a lot of thought to the topic, and I don't hold with that idea at all. A few years back, I wrote a small book on the subject, under a nom de plume, of course, that was rather well-received. My theory is that the aberration is a philosophical one, not a psychological one. At a certain stage, the realization striked through that one must either live outside of society's bonds or die of absolute boredom. There is no future or freedom in the circumscribed life, and the only other life is complete rejection of the rules. There is no longer room for the soldier of fortune or the gentleman adventurer who can live both within and outside of society. Today, it is all or nothing. To save my own sanity, I chose the nothing. The cab just reached the spaceport as I hit on this negative line of thought, and I was glad to abandon it. Loneliness is the thing to fear in this business. That and self-pity can destroy you if they get the upper hand. Action has always helped me. The elation of danger and escape always clears my mind. When I paid the cab, I shortchanged the driver right under his nose, palming one of the credit notes in the act of handing it to him. He was blind as a riveted bulkhead. His gullibility had me humming with delight. The tip I gave him more than made up the loss, since I only do this sort of petty business to break the monotony. There was a robot clerk behind the ticket window. He had that extra third eye in the centre of his forehead that meant a camera. It clicked slightly as I purchased a ticket recording my face and destination. A normal precaution on the part of the police. I would have been surprised if it hadn't happened. My destination was inter-system, so I doubted if the picture would appear any place except in the files. I wasn't making an interstellar hop this time, as I usually did after a big hot job. It wasn't necessary. After a job, a single world or a small system is too small for more work. But Beta Cygnus has a system of almost 20 planets, all with terrified weather. This planet, 3, was too hot now, but the rest of the system was wide open. There was a lot of commercial rivalry within the system, and I knew the police departments didn't cooperate too well. They would pay the price for that. My ticket was for Mori, number 18, a large and mostly agricultural planet. There were a number of little stores at the spaceport. 
I shopped them carefully and outfitted a new suitcase with a complete wardrobe and travelling essentials. The tailor was saved for last. He ran up a couple of travelling suits and a formal kilt for me, and I took them into the fitting booth. Strictly by accident, I managed to hang one of the suits over the optic bug in the wall and made undressing sounds with my feet while I doctored the ticket I had just bought. The other end of my cigar cutter was a punch. With it, I altered the keyed holes that indicated my destination. I was now going to planet 10, not 18, and I had lost almost 200 credits with the alteration. That's the secret of ticket and order changing. Don't raise the face value. There is too good a chance that this will be noticed. If you lower the value and lose money on the deal, even if it's caught, people will be sure it is a mistake on the machine's part. There is never the shadow of a doubt, since why would anyone change a ticket to lose money? Before the police could be suspicious, I had the suit off the bug and I tried it on, taking my time. Almost everything was ready now. I had about an hour to kill before the ship left. I spent the time wisely by going to an automatic cleaner and having all my new clothes cleaned and pressed. Nothing interests a customs man more than a suitcase full of unworn clothes. Customs was a snap, and when the ship was about half full, I boarded her and took a seat near the hostess. I flirted with her until she walked away, having classified me in the category of male, brash, annoying. An old girl who had a seat next to mine also had me filed in the same drawer and was looking out of the window with obvious ice on her shoulder. I dozed off happily, since there is one thing better than not being noticed, and that is being noticed and filed into a category. Your description gets mixed up with every other guy in the file, and that is the end of it. When I woke up, we were almost to planet 10. I half dozed in the chair until we touched down then smoked a cigar while my bag cleared customs. My locked briefcase of money raised no suspicion since I had foresightedly forged paper six months ago my occupation listed as bank messenger. Interplanet credit was almost non-existent in this system, so the customsmen were used to seeing a lot of cash go back and forth. Almost by habit I confused the trail a little more and ended up in the large manufacturing city of Brach, over 1,000 kilometres from the point where I had landed. Using an entirely new set of identification papers, I registered at a quiet hotel in the suburbs. Usually, after a big job like this, I rest up for a month or two. This was one time, though, I didn't feel like a rest. When I was making small purchases around town to rebuild the personality of James de Grizz, I was also keeping my eyes open for a new business opportunities. The very first day I was out, I saw what looked like a natural, and every day it looked better and better. One of the main reasons I have stayed out of the arms of the law for as long as I have is that I have never repeated myself. I have dreamed up some of the sweetest little rackets, run them off once, and stayed away from them forever after. About the only thing they had in common was the fact that they all made money. About the only thing I hadn't hit to date was out-and-out -out armed robbery. It was time for a change, and it looked like that it was. While I was rebuilding the paunchy personality of Slippery Jim, I was making plans for the operation. Just about the time the fingerprint gloves were ready, the entire business was planned. It was simple like all good operations should be. The less details there are, the less things there are that can go wrong. I was going to hold up Morayo's, the largest retail store in the city. Every evening, at exactly the same time, an armoured car took the day's receipts to the bank. It was a tempting prize, a gigantic sum in untraceable small bills. The only real problem, as far as I was concerned, was how one man could handle the sheer bulk and weight of all that money. When I had an answer to that, the entire operation was ready. All the preparations were, of course, made only in my mind until the personality of James de Gris was again ready. The day I slipped that weighted belly back on, I felt I was back in uniform. I lit my first cigarette almost with satisfaction, then went to work. 
a day or two for some purchases and a few simple thefts, and I was ready. I scheduled the following afternoon for the job. A large tractor truck that I had bought was the key to the operation. Along with some necessary alterations I had made to the interior, I parked the truck in an L-shaped alley about a half mile from Mariah's. The truck almost completely blocked the alley, but that wasn't important since it was used only in the early morning. It was a leisurely stroll back to the department store. I reached it at almost the same moment that the armoured truck pulled up. I leaned against the wall of the gigantic building while the guards carried out the money. My money. To someone of little imagination, I suppose it would have been an awe-inspiring sight. At least five armed guards standing around the entrance, two more inside the truck as well as the driver and his assistant. As an added precaution, there were three monocycles purring next to the curb. They would go with the truck as protection on the road. Oh, very impressive. I had to stifle a grin behind my cigarette when I thought about what was going to happen to those elaborate precautions. I had been counting the hand trucks of money as they rolled out of the door. There were always fifteen. No more, no less. This practice made it easy for me to know the exact time to begin. Just as 14 was being loaded into the armoured truck, load number 15 appeared in the store entrance. The truck driver had been counting the way I had. He stepped down from the cab and moved to the door on the rear in order to lock it when the loading was finished. We synchronised perfectly as we strolled by each other. At the moment he reached the rear door, I reached the cab quietly and smoothly. I climbed up into it and slammed the door behind me. The assistant had just enough time to open his mouth and pop his eyes when I placed an anaesthetic bomb on his lap. He slumped in an instant. I was, of course, wearing the correct filter plugs in my nostrils. As I started the motor with my left hand, I threw a larger bomb through the connecting window to the rear with my right. There were some reassuring thumps as the guards there dropped over the bags of change. This entire process hadn't taken six seconds. The guards on the steps were just waking up to the fact that something was wrong. I gave them a cheerful wave through the window and gunned the armoured truck away from the curb. One of them tried to run and throw himself through the open rear door, but it was a little too late. It all had happened so fast that not one of them had thought to shoot. I'd been sure there would have been a few bullets. The sedentary life on these planets does slow the reflexes. The monocycle drivers caught on a lot faster. They were after me before the truck had gone a hundred feet. I slowed down until they had caught up, then stamped on the accelerator, keeping just enough speed so they couldn't pass me. Their sirens were screaming, of course, and they had their guns working. It was just as I had planned. We tore down the street like jet races and the traffic melted away before us. They didn't have time to think and realise that they were making sure the road was clear for my escape. The situation was very humorous, and I'm afraid I chuckled out loud as I tooled the truck around the tight corners. Of course the alarm had been turned in, and the roadblocks must have been forming up ahead, but that half mile went by fast at the speed we were doing. It was a matter of seconds before I saw the alley mouth ahead. I turned the truck into it, at the same time pressing the button on my pocket shortwave. Along the entire length of the alley, my smoke bombs ignited. They were, of course, homemade, as was all my equipment. Nevertheless, they produced an adequately dense cloud in that narrow alley. I pulled the truck a bit to the right until the fenders scraped the wall and only slightly reduced my speed. This way I could steer by touch. The monocycle drivers, of course, couldn't do this and had the choice of stopping or rushing headlong into the darkness. I hope they made the right decision and none of them were hurt. The same radio impulse that triggered the bombs was supposed to have opened the rear door of the trailer truck up ahead and dropped the ramp. It had worked fine when I had tested it. I could only hope now that it did the same in practice. I tried to estimate the distance I had gone in the alley by timing my speed, but I was a little off. The front wheels of the truck hit the ramp with a destructive crash and the armoured truck bounced rather than rolled into the interior of the larger van. I was jarred around a bit and had just enough sense left to jam on the brakes before I ploughed right through into the cab. Smoke from the bombs made a black midnight of everything 
and that and my shaken up brains almost ruined the entire operation. Valuable seconds went by when I leaned against the truck wall trying to get oriented. I don't know how long it took. When I finally did stumble back to the rear door, I could hear the guards' voices calling back and forth through the smoke. They heard the bent ramp creak as I lifted it, so I threw two gas bombs out to quieten them down. The smoke was starting to thin as I climbed up the cab of the tractor and gunned it into life. A few feet down the alley and I broke through into sunlight. The alley mouth opened out into a main street a few feet ahead and I saw two police cars tear by. When the truck reached the street I stopped and took careful note of all witnesses. None of them showed any interest in the truck or the alley. Apparently all the commotion was still at the other end of the alley. I poured power into the engine and rolled out into the street, away from the store I had just robbed. Of course I only went a few blocks in that direction, then turned down the side street. At the next corner I turned again and headed back toward Murayo's, the scene of my recent crime. The cool air coming in the window soon had me feeling better. I actually whistled a bit as I threaded the big truck through the service roads. It would have been fine to go up to the highway in front of Murayo's and see all the excitement, but that would have been only asking for trouble. Time was still important. I'd carefully led out a route that avoided all congested traffic, and this was what I followed. It was only a matter of minutes before I was pulling into the loading area in the back of the big store. There was a certain amount of excitement here, but it was lost in the normal bustle of commerce. Here and there, a knot of truck drivers or shipping foremen were exchanging views on the robbery, since robots don't gossip the normal work was going on. The men were, of course, so excited that no attention was paid to my truck when I pulled into the parking line next to the other vans. I killed the engine and settled back with a satisfied sigh. The first part was complete. The second part of the operation was just as important, though. I dug into my paunch for the kit that I always take on the job, for just such an emergency as this. Normally, I don't believe in stimulants, but I was still groggy from the banging around. Two cc's of linotin in my anti-cubicle cleared that up quickly enough. The spring was back in my step when I went into the back of the van. The driver's assistant and the guards were still out and would stay that way for at least ten hours. I arranged them in a neat row in the front of the truck where they wouldn't be in my way and went to work. The armoured car almost filled the body of the trailer as I knew it would, therefore I had fastened the boxes to the walls. There were fine, strong shipping boxes with Murayos printed all over them. It was a minor theft from their warehouse that should go unnoticed. I pulled the boxes down and folded them for packing. I was soon sweating and had to take my shirt off as I packed the money bundles into the boxes. It took almost two hours to stuff and seal the boxes with tape. Every ten minutes or so I would check through the peephole in the door. Only the normal activities were going on. The police undoubtedly had the entire town sealed and were tearing it apart building by building looking for the truck. I was fairly sure that the last place they would think of looking was the rear of the robbed store. The warehouse that had provided the boxes had also provided a supply of shipping forms. I fixed one of these on each box, addressed to different pickup addresses, and marked paid, of course, and was ready to finish the operation. It was almost dark by this time. However, I knew the shipping department would be busy most of the night. The engine caught on the first revolution, and I pulled out of the parking rank and backed slowly up to the platform. There was a relatively quiet area where the shipping dock met the receiving dock. I stopped the trailer as close to the dividing line as I could. I didn't open the rear door until all the workmen were faced in a different direction. Even the stupidest of them would have been interested in why a truck was unloading the firm's own boxes. As I piled them up on the platform, I threw a tarp over them. It only took a few minutes. Only when the truck gates were closed and locked did I pull off the tarp and sit down on the boxes for a smoke. It wasn't a long wait. Before the cigarette was finished, a robot from the shipping department passed close enough for me to call him. Over there, the M19 that was loading these burned out a brake band. You better see that they're taken care of. 
His eyes glowed with the light of duty. Some of these higher M types take their job very seriously. I had to step back quickly as the forklifts and M trucks appeared out of the doors behind me. There was a scurry of loading and sorting and my haul vanished down the platform. I lighted another cigarette and watched for a while as the boxes were coded and stamped and loaded on the outgoing trucks and local belts. All that was left for me now was the disposing of the truck on some side street and changing personalities. As I was getting into the truck, I realized for the first time that something was wrong. I, of course, had been keeping an eye on the gate, but not watching it closely enough. Trucks had been going in and out. Now the realization hit me like a hammer blow over the solar plexus. They were the same trucks going both ways. A large red cross-country job was just pulling out. I heard the echo of his exhaust roar down the street, then die away to an idling grumble. When it roared up again, it didn't go away. Instead, the truck came in through the second gate. There were police cards waiting outside that wall, waiting for me. For the first time in my career, I felt the sharp fear of the hunted man. This was the first time I had ever had the police on my tail when I wasn't expecting them. The money was lost, that much I was certain. But I was no longer concerned with that. It was me they were after now. Think first, then act. I was safe enough for the moment. They were, of course, moving in on me, going slowly as they had no idea of where I was in the giant loading yard. How had they found me? That was the important point. The local police were used to an almost crimeless world. They couldn't have found my trail this quick. In fact, I hadn't left a trail. Whoever had set the trap here had done it with logic and reason. Unbidden, the words jumped into my mind. The special core. Nothing was ever printed about it. Only a thousand whispered words heard on a thousand worlds around the galaxy the Special Core, the branch of the League that took care of the troubles that individual planets couldn't solve. The Core was supposed to have finished off the remnants of Haskell's raiders after the peace, of putting the illegal T and Z traders out of business, of finally catching Inskip. And now they were after me. They were out there waiting for me to make a break. They were thinking of all the ways out just as I was, and they were blocking them. I had to think fast, and I had to think right. Only two ways out. Through the gates, or through the store. The gates were too well covered to make a break. In the store there would be other ways out. It had to be that way. Even as I made the conclusion, I knew that other minds had made it too. That men were moving in to cover those exits. That thought brought fear, and made me angry as well. The very idea that someone could outthink me was odious. They could try all right, but I would give them a run for their money. I still had a few tricks left. First, a little misdirection. I started the truck, left it in low gear, and aimed it at the gate. When I was going straight, I locked the steering wheel with a friction clamp and dropped out the far side of the cab and strolled back to the warehouse. Once inside, I moved faster. Behind me I heard some shots, a heavy crump, and a lot of shouting. That was more like it. The night locks were connected on the doors that net led to the store proper. An old-fashioned alarm that I could disconnect in a few moments. My pick locks opened the door and I gave it a quick kick with my foot and turned away. There were no alarm bells, but I knew that somewhere in the building an indicator showed that the door was opened. As fast as I could run, I went to the last door on the opposite side of the building. This time, I made sure the alarm was disconnected before I went through the door. I locked it behind me. It is the hardest job in the world to run and to be quiet at the same time. My lungs were burning before I reached the employee's entrance. A few times I saw flashlights ahead and had to double down different aisles. It was mostly luck that I made it without being spotted. There were two men in uniform standing in front of the door I wanted to go out. 
Keeping as close to the wall as I could, I made it to within twenty feet of them before I threw the gas grenade. For one second I was sure that they had gas masks on and I'd reached the end of the road. Then they slumped down. One of them was blocking the door. I rolled him aside and slid it open a few inches. The searchlight couldn't have been more than thirty feet from the door. When it flashed on, the light was more pain than glare. I dropped the instant it came on, and the slugs from the machine pistol ate a line of glaring holes across the door. My ears were numb from the roar of the exploding slugs, and I could just make out the thud of running footsteps. My own seventy-five was in my hand, and I put an entire clip of slugs through the door, aiming high so I wouldn't hurt anyone. It would not stop them, but it would slow them down. They returned the fire. Must have been a whole squad out there. Pieces of plastic flew out the back wall and slugs screamed down the corridor. It was good cover. I knew there was nobody coming up behind me. Keeping as flat as I could, I crawled in the opposite direction, out of the line of fire. I turned two corners before I was far enough from the guns to risk standing up. My knees were shaky, and great blobs of colour kept fogging my vision. The searchlight had got done a good job. I could barely see it all in the dim light. I kept moving slowly, trying to get as far away from the gunfire as possible. The squad outside had fired as soon as I had opened the door. That meant standing orders to shoot at anyone who tried to leave the building. A nice trap. The cops inside would keep looking until they found me. If I tried to leave, I would be blasted. I was beginning to feel very much like a trapped rat. Every light in the store came on, and I stopped, frozen. I was near the wall of a large farm goods showroom. Across the room from me were three soldiers. We spotted each other at the same time. I dived for the door with bullets slapping all around me. The military was in it too. They sure must have wanted me bad. A bank of elevators was on the other side of the door, and stairs leading up. I hit the elevator in one bounce and punched the sub-basement button, and thus got out ahead of the closing doors. The stairs were back towards the approaching soldiers. I felt like I was running right into their guns. I must have made the turn into the stairs a split second ahead of their arrival. Up the stairs and around the first landing before they were even with the bottom. Luck was still on my side. They hadn't seen me and were sure I had gone down. I sagged against the wall, listening to the shouts and whistle-blowing as I turned the hunt towards the basement. There was one smart one in the bunch. While the others were all following the phony trail, I heard him start slowly up the stairs. I didn't have any gas grenades left. All I could do was climb up ahead of him, trying to do it without making a sound. He came on slowly and steadily, and I stayed ahead of him. We went up four flights that way, me in my stockinged feet with my new shoes around my leg, his heavy boots behind me making a dull rasping on the metal stairs. As I started up the fifth flight, I stopped, my foot halfway up a step. Someone else was coming down, someone wearing the same kind of military boots. I found the door to the hall, opened it behind me, and slipped through. There was a long hall in front of me, lined with offices of some kind. I began to run the length of it, trying to reach a turning before the door behind me could open and those exploding slugs tear me in half. The hall seemed endless, and I suddenly realised I would never make it to the end in time. I was a rat looking for a hole, and there was none. The doors were locked, all of them. I tried each as I came to it, knowing I would never make it. That stairwell door was opening behind me, and the gun was coming up. I didn't dare turn and look, but I could feel it. When the door opened under my hand, I fell through before I realised what had happened. I locked it behind me and leaned against it in the darkness, panting like a spent animal. Then the light came on, and I saw the man sitting behind the desk, smiling at me. There is a limit to the amount of shock the human body can absorb. I had had mine. I didn't care if he shot me or offered a cigarette. I had reached the end of my line. He didn't either. He offered me a cigar instead. Have one of these degrees. I believe they're your brand. The body is a slave of habit. 
even with death a few inches away, it will respond to established custom. My fingers moved on their own volition and took the cigar. My lips clenched it and my lungs sucked it into life. And all the time my eyes watched the man behind the desk waiting for death to reach out. It must have shown. He waved towards a chair and carefully kept both hands in sight on top of the desk. I still had my gun. It was trained on him. Sit down, Degris. Put that cannon away. If I wanted to kill you, I could have done it a lot easier than herding you into this room. His eyebrows moved up in surprise when he saw the expression on my face. Don't tell me you thought it was an accident that you ended up here. I had, up until that moment, and the lack of intelligent reasoning on my part brought on a wave of shame that snapped me back to reality. I had been outwitted and outfought. The least I could do was surrender graciously. I threw the gun on the desk and dropped into the offered chair. He swept the pistol neatly into a drawer and relaxed a bit himself. Had me worried there for a minute, the way you stood there, rolling your eyes and waving this piece of field artillery around. Who are you? He smiled at the abruptness of my tone. Well, it doesn't matter who I am. What does matter is the organization that I represent. The core, exactly, the special core. You didn't think I was a local police, did you? They have orders to shoot you on sight. It was only after I told them how to find you that they let the corpse come along on the job. I have some of my men in the building. They're the ones who herded you up here. The rest are all locals with itchy trigger fingers. It wasn't very flattering, but it was true. I had been pushed around like a Class M robot, with every move charted in advance. The old boy behind the desk, for the first time I realised he was about sixty-five, really had my number. The game was over. All right, Mr. Detective, you have me so there's no sense in gloating. What's next on the programme? Psychological reorientation, lobotomy, or just plain firing squad? None of those, I'm afraid. I'm here to offer you a job on the core. The whole thing was so ludicrous that I almost fell out of the chair laughing. Me, James de Gris, the interplanet thief working as a policeman, was just too funny. The other one sat patiently, waiting until I was through. I will admit it that it has its ludicrous side, but only at first glance. If you stop to think, you will have to admit that who is better qualified to catch a thief than another thief? There was more than a little truth in that, but I wasn't buying my freedom by turning stool pigeon. An interesting offer, but I'm not getting out of this by playing the rat. There is even a code among thieves, you know. That made him angry. He was bigger than he looked sitting down, and the fist he shook in my face was as large as a shoe. What kind of stupidity do you call that? It sounds like a line out of a TV thriller. You've never met another crook in your whole life, and you know it. And if you did, you would cheerfully turn him in if you could make a profit on the deal. The entire essence of your life is individualism. That, and the excitement of doing what others can't do. Well, that's over now, and you better start admitting it to yourself. You can no longer be the inner planet playboy you used to be. But you can do a job that will require every bit of your special talents and abilities. Have you ever killed a man? His change of pace caught me off guard. I stumbled out an answer. No, not that I know of. Well, you haven't, if that will make you sleep any better at night. You're not a homicidal. I checked that on your record before I came out after you. That is why I know you'll join the corps and get a great deal of pleasure out of going after the other kind of criminal, who is sick, not just socially protesting. The man who can kill and enjoy it. He was too convincing. He had all the answers. I had only one more argument, and I threw it in with the air of a last-ditch defence. What about the Corps? If they ever find out you are hiring half-reformed criminals to do your dirty work, will we both be shot at dawn? This time it was his turn to laugh. I could see nothing funny, so I ignored him until it was finished. In the first place, my boy, I am the Corps, at least the man at the top. 
And what do you think my name is? Harold Peters Inskip, that's what it is. Not the Inskip, that's the same. Inskip, the uncatchable. The man who looted for a Sidian too in mid-flight and pulled out all those other deals I'm sure you read about in your misspent youth. I was recruited just the way you were. He had me on the ropes. He must have seen my rolling eyes, so he moved in for the king. And who do you think the rest of our agents are? I don't mean the bright-eyed grads of our technical schools, like the ones on my squad downstairs. I mean the full agents, the men who plan the operations, do the preliminary field work, and see that everything comes off smoothly. They're crooks. All crooks. The better they were on their own, the better a job they do for the core. It's a great, big, brawling universe, and you should be surprised at some of the problems that come up. The only men we can recruit to do the job are the ones who have already succeeded at it. Are you on? It had happened too fast, and I hadn't had time to think. I would probably go on arguing for an hour, but way down in the back of my mind the decision had been made. I was going to do it. I couldn't say no. There was the beginning of a warm glow too. The human race is gregarious. I knew that, even though I had been denying it for years. I was going to keep on doing the loneliest job in the universe, only I wasn't going to be doing it alone. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!